Well, we are continuing in our study of the Sermon on the Plain, and turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. We're going to pick up in our reading there in just a moment. And our scripture for this uh, second message comes to us from Luke 6, verses 27 through 36. Most of us, I am sure, uh, know the uh, harrowing account of Jim Elliot. He was, as we know, martyred with four of his fellow missionaries in the jungles of Ecuador in 1956. And he left behind a wife, Elizabeth. They had been married just over two years uh, with an infant daughter. And as you might imagine, Elizabeth Elliot uh, now faced with a future that she had not uh, foreseen, was having to decide what the rest of her life would look like, what to do next. And Elizabeth Elliot made the decision to return to Ecuador, to return to the very same tribesmen who had taken the lives of her husband and his colleagues in order to bring the gospel to them. Now, why in the world would anyone do something like that? Well, there is no reason in the world why anyone would do something like that. But there is a reason, and it's not found in this world. It, it is found out of this world. It is to be found in the kingdom of God, in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to look at now in our scripture. So read along with me, if you would, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. And before we read now, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. We Thank you that uh, your word searches us and sifts us and that even when you bring us hard words, you do so not in order to crush us, but to build us up, uh, to draw us closer to yourself. And so we pray that you would help us now to listen to the voice of the Savior and in the power of your spirit to respond in faith and in obedience, that he would be exalted in our lives. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Hear now God's word, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 36. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Well, the grass withers the flower falls, the word of our God stands forever. So we are with Jesus, who has now called to himself, after a night of prayer, 12 apostles. And he has started down the mountain, and he is thronged by disciples and 
by crowds. We're at a turning point in his ministry. He performs miracles to show the power of grace to bring sinners from death to life, and then he proceeds to teach his disciples. The grace that rescues us from sin will not leave us in that sin. We have seen him pronouncing blessings and woes. God will fill those who are empty in his presence and those who would be full of self and the world before God, he will empty. And now Jesus picks up a new theme, love your enemies. It, it is the way our scripture begins and ends. Verse 27, again, verse 35. Now, what accounts for this change? Well, in verse 22, Jesus told his disciples plainly, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. This is what godliness is going to encounter in this world. Hatred, exclusion, reviling, spurning. So how are the godly to respond to all of this? And here Jesus gives us clear direction. He shows us what we're to do, how we're to respond. He says, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. <clears throat> this is a, a hard and countercultural word. And Jesus does more than tell us what to do. He is going to point us to the motive and power to do it, and he is going to give us a model or a pattern for this hard work. And so those are the things that I want us to see. I want us to look at this call to love our enemies. I want us to see three things about this command to love our enemies. In the first place, I want us to look at the matter of our duty. What exactly does Jesus call us to do? What does it mean to love your enemies. Well, in brief, Jesus says you're to do good to them. Verse 27 and verse 35. What does that look like practically? What does it mean to do good to those who hate you? Well, to do good in the first place, Jesus says, is action. Jesus, you see, is thinking of love here, not in terms of feeling or sentiment, he is thinking in terms of things that we do. So look at how he describes what we're to do for those who hate us. Verse 28, we're to pronounce blessing upon them. We are to pray for them. Verse 29, turn the other cheek, give them our tunic. Verse 30, give to the one who begs. Don't demand goods back when someone takes them from you. We are, in other words, to do good. Not just not to harm them, not just not to give back what they have given to us, but we are to work for their true and spiritual good, Jesus says. Now, somebody objects. Maybe you've heard this. Maybe you're thinking this. Jesus, are we really supposed to live this way? Do you really mean to say when, when someone comes up and hits me and assaults me, I, I'm meant to offer them another blow? Allow them to hit me on another part of me? Do you mean when someone steals something from me, I am not to ask for it back? Do you mean if someone takes my coat that I'm to offer them my shirt as well? And, and there have been, in the history of the church, People who have argued this is exactly what Jesus is teaching. And so if an armed intruder comes into your home, you're not to meet them with resistance and force. Well, we need to give a careful look at what Jesus is and is not saying. Jesus here, you understand, is getting our attention. He is 
shocking us to get our attention, much in the same way that he said, if your, your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He is trying to help us appreciate the seriousness of sin and of the measures we're to take in response to sin. And so the rest of the scripture tells us, of course, you can call the authorities if you're being attacked or robbed. Of course, you are not to put yourself in harm's way. Of course, you can defend yourself from an unprovoked attack. Jesus himself, you remember, in his trial, John 18, when he was unjustly cuffed by a servant of the high priest, he, he admonished him. He, he spoke a word. So what is Jesus saying here? What Jesus is saying very simply is don't indulge a spirit of vengeance. Don't <clears throat> live life to even the score with people who have hurt you. Don't fight fire with fire. For my name's sake, your honor and your name, your health, your property, your reputation are going to come under attack. Do not fight the world with the world's weapons. <clears throat> Rather, Jesus says, they're trying to harm you, you do them good. They're trying to destroy them, you, you seek to build them up. They're trying to curse you, you try to bless them. This beggar has no right to alms, and he's begging you insistently. Well, Jesus says you give it to him anyway. So, so that's the what of, that we're to do. Love is an action. Well, to whom are we to do it? In short, Jesus says, to those who don't deserve it. Here are our enemies. They hate us, they curse us, they abuse us, they strike us, they steal from us. He, here's the beggar. No, he doesn't do those awful things to us, but he has no claim on us. And Jesus says, you don't treat them according to their deserves. You don't treat them according to their character. Our standard is the command of Jesus Christ. Verse 31, as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. The world has its own standards of how it deals with these actions. And now, disciple, you have yours, my word. As you would have others do to you, you do so to them. So there's the matter of our duty, according to Jesus. Now, how does this apply to us? In the first place, Jesus is telling you, he's telling me, he says, if you're my disciple, this is how you're going to be treated in the world. And if you're his, you need to expect this kind of treatment. Of course, what often happens, it's true in my life, I'm sure it's true in your life, is that we get surprised, we get caught off guard. You remember this was happening even in the early church. So Peter had to write the early Christians in 1 Peter 4 and say, don't be surprised at this fiery trial that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And Jesus is saying, no, I have told you in advance, it is going to be this way. It, it will happen in our places of work. It will happen in our families, in our schools, in our neighborhoods. Are you prepared? Are you counting the cost? Are you, are you ready to respond when it happens, not if it happens. Secondly, Jesus knows the spirit of vengeance that lies in every heart and that tempts each and every one of us. How is it with you? Many of the things Jesus describes here happen in the church. And there's not a one of us as a believer who hasn't been wronged or harmed and sometimes by other Christians. What are the temptations before you and me? 
were tempted to plot revenge, to, to lose sleep, to spend hours thinking how we're going to get even with those who have harmed us. We think of ways to cut them out of our lives. We think of ways to marginalize them. We tell ourselves this person has ruined my life forever and we become a victim. And Jesus is saying, when those temptations come, you, you shut the door. The world excuses these responses. The world celebrates these responses. And Jesus Christ says to you and to me, child, this is sin. I forbid you from doing it. And so Jesus wants you and he wants me to search our hearts. How are we responding to this kind of treatment and opposition when it comes? And Jesus is clear about our response. Don't confuse Jesus' teaching here with sentimentalism. Love is not doing what makes me feel good or what makes them feel good. Love is doing what Jesus Christ has commanded in his word. And Jesus calls you, he calls me to do true good to those who are in our lives. And the one who defines what is good is not the world, it is not the other person, it is God himself. And so Jesus is saying, you do what is for that person's true and spiritual good. Do nothing that would encourage them in the way of sin. And that may mean that in love you will call that person out on their sin. It may mean that in love you will call the authorities. It may mean that in helping the beggar, you will not give him what he wants, but you will give him what he really needs. Now, there's a way for us to look at all of our relationships, not just these tense ones, not just in response to those who are mistreating us, but all of our relationships. Am, am I working to do real, lasting spiritual good in this person's life? And you see, one of the best things that we can do according to Jesus, comes right out of our mouths. It is to bless and not curse, verse 28. Many of you know of Don Carson. Don Carson wrote a lovely memoir of his father, who was, by his own telling, an ordinary pastor in Ontario and Quebec in the mid-20th century. And when Don Carson went to college, he was seated in a church history class. And he had a professor say, when I get to heaven, I want to see Tom Carson's crown. Well, this, this was Don Carson's father. And, and he perked up. And so he asked his church history professor, what do you mean? And he said, you, you've never heard. And he began to relate to him how years before, Tom Carson, Don Carson's father, had run afoul of one of the most powerful Baptist ministers in Toronto. And his, his life, his livelihood, his reputation was ruined. And Don Carson knew nothing of it, not from his mom, not from his dad. He, he had to go to a college classroom to learn about it. And, and so he, he approached his father. He said, what, what happened? Why didn't you tell me? And his father said, your, your mother and I vowed that we would speak no evil of that minister. And the Lord wonderfully blessed that vow. And all that Don Carson heard in that home were words of blessing relating to that matter, that hard matter, not words of cursing and reviling. And the Lord worked wonderfully by it. Do you bless? And do you pray? Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. 
Do you, do you pray that God would have mercy on you? And you think, especially in, in the heat of, of trial and, and when the harm is so great and the sting is so powerful, you, you say, what, what good does a prayer do? Well, a prayer can do a lot of good. We have an amazing example of this right in the New Testament. You remember Stephen, the first documented martyr of the church, and he is, he is carried off by a mob under the, the gaze of the authorities as they turn the other way. Stephen will see no justice in this life as his life is dispatched by a, by a horrible death. And we're told that as, as Stephen is preparing to leave this world, he he sees his Savior standing at the right hand of God. And of course, his, his enemies are infuriated. And Stephen prays, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he dies. Luke tells us that one of the people there, the coat check man, was a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And Jesus Christ, who heard that prayer, answered that prayer by having mercy, showing mercy on the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road. Think of all that the Apostle Paul has done for and meant to the Church of Jesus Christ, even your own life. And all of that is traced back to the prayer of a dying martyr who did not pray that Jesus would curse those who were cursing him, but he prayed that those who persecuted him would find mercy from the Savior. And how the Lord blessed that prayer. So do you pray? Well, there's the matter of our duty. We turn in the next place to the motive for our duty. What, what motivates us to do good? And that comes in verses 32 into verse 35. And here's how Jesus puts it. He said, the world works by reciprocity. Verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Verse 33, sinners do good to those who do good to them. Verse 34, sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. That's the way the world works. You help those who help you. You help those who are in a position to help you. And Jesus says, your, your love has to rise far higher than that. How high? Jesus says, you and I don't work by reciprocity. We work by looking to the reward. Verse 35, love your enemies, do good and lend, experiencing nothing in return. Your reward will be great. What's Jesus saying? You don't treat people and deal with people because you think they're going to do something for you in return. Rather, you don't deal with anyone that way. You don't deal with God that way. But know that God is in heaven. And when he looks at your obedience to him in this hard place, he sees it. And he will bless you in his own way and in his own time. This reward is God himself. God bringing us closer to him, nearness to God, enjoying his favor and fellowship. So there's the motive for our duty. Not reciprocity, but the reward. How does this apply to us? I don't have to tell you we live in just the kind of world Jesus is describing. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And that is a low and cheap version of love. That is a counterfeit of what Jesus is describing here. And Jesus says, disciple, I don't want you to treat other people that way. I want you to treat others expecting nothing in return. We live in this world 
and the air of this world sometimes makes its way into the church, into our own lives. It makes its way into our marriages. It makes its way into the way we relate to our children. It relates to the, it breaks into the way that we relate to leaders in the church, to congregants in the church. How often do people look at the church as a place to get something, not as a place to serve and spend oneself for Jesus Christ? How tempting is it for leaders to favor one person in the congregation over another person in the congregation? Maybe it's because of wealth or influence. Maybe it's just because they're easier people to deal with and minister to and they, they shy away from, they, they don't serve. All of those, all of the sheep who were placed before them. How do we correct this? Because you and I know the pull of this in our own lives. And Jesus says, I want you to think of your father. How generous has he been to you? How out of proportion has his treatment of you been? He hasn't dealt with you as you deserve. So you look to your father. This is a hard work, make no mistake about it. But Jesus says you have a Father in heaven and you aim to please him. Will you take up your Savior's call? So Jesus has given us the matter of our duty. Love your enemies and do good. He has shown us the motive for our duty, not reciprocity, but your heavenly reward. And he finally points us to the model of our duty. And that comes in verses 35 and 36. And that model is God himself. Now, I am not a person who is mechanically inclined. I just don't do well trying to put things together or trying to fix things. And on the rare cases when I have to do it and I have no choice, I need a picture. I need something that will show me what it looks like. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. In, in this hard work where so much is at stake, love your enemies. Christian, you have a model. You have a, a place to look to see what this looks like. And he says, you look to your father. Who is your father? Verse 35 he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Our Father in heaven is merciful. You see, Jesus is saying, God doesn't deal with you as you deserve. God only does good to us. God has shown pity and compassion to us. We, we were his enemies. We spurned him. We reviled him. And he showed mercy upon us. We were worse off than street beggars. And he has provided richly for us. And never once has God dealt with us to get something in return from us. We can't offer God anything. He hasn't given to us that we can repay him. And so who is our father? He is the God who takes sinners, and Jesus says in our scripture, he makes us, verse 35, sons of the Most High. I want you to think about what it means to be a son of the Most High. God has taken us, worse off than beggars, enemies, and he has brought us into his family, and he has made us his son. What does it mean to be his son? It means a lot of things, but one of the things it means to be the son of the Father is that we resemble the Father. You fathers, your sons, you can remember times as your sons were growing up that they, they wanted to look like you, they wanted to dress like you. Even today, 
perhaps people point out, you know, your, your son talks like you. He's, he's got the same mannerisms that you do. And Jesus is saying, every Christian, son of the Most High, you resemble your Heavenly Father so that when you go out into the world, and especially in these hard places, people can say, I, I don't see that in the world around me. But that sure looks like the Father who is in heaven. And what did it take for God to bring us into his family? What did it take for God to have mercy on sinners like us? Well, it took him sending his own beloved son, his only begotten son, into the world. It, it took the son agreeing to take upon him the form of a servant. And the Son came into this world and he endured the hatred and the cursing and the reviling and the abuse of his enemies. And they would strike him on the cheek. They would strip him of his garments. Why did Jesus endure that treatment? Why would the Father give over his beloved Son to such people as these? Why did Jesus submit to the humiliation of betrayal and arrest and trial and torture? Why is it Jesus never once resisted? Why is it he never spoke an ill word? Why is it when he said, I could call down 12 legions of angels now, that he never did so? And the answer the scripture says is because this is what it took for God to love us. This is what it took for God to rescue us from sin, to rescue us from the guilt of sin and the dominion of sin and the pollution of sin. That's what it took for God to build a family of sinners, to take children spiritually of Satan and to make them sons and daughters of the living God. What a model we have in our Father. Well, as, as we close, how does this apply to us? Well, do you see what God calls you to be and to do to the people in your life? And especially the people who don't treat you the way that you should be treated. You are to reflect to them what he has first done for you in Jesus Christ. And that's a question every time we meet someone, and especially every time we meet someone who is mistreating us, and it could be someone who is very close to us, we say, Father, how has my Savior treated me? How have you loved me? Father, give me grace that I would treat this person the way you have first treated me. And Jesus says, if, if you won't do this, you have to ask, are you a son of the Most High? But Jesus says, in this hard place, all you need do is look to the Father and ask for help, and he will do it. And here's the reason that you know he will, because this God is kind to the ungrateful, to the evil, and this God is merciful. This is a God who has pity and compassion on sinners. And if he's had pity and compassion on you, and you're in this hard place, he doesn't change. He's called you to be here so that you can be a reflection of his mercy and compassion and pity to those around you. What a privilege. Would you ask him for grace to do just that? And of course, we, we have a powerful example in Elizabeth Elliot. We mentioned her at the very beginning of our message. This young widow with a daughter just 
a year or so in age. She, she came back to Ecuador. She came back to the very Indians who had deprived her of her husband and her daughter of her father. And by all accounts, the Lord blessed that ministry powerfully. It was through her ongoing ministry to these Aka Indians that many of them were converted. Apparently, some of the men who had murdered Elliot and his co-workers came to faith in Christ through that ongoing work of ministry that Elizabeth Elliot and others were engaged in there. Her life was a parable. It was an illustration of the love of God in Jesus Christ for the undeserving and for sinners. I think that's a good question for all of us, especially those of us who were engaged in Christian work. What's driving the, the way that you live your life? What is driving the way that you treat other people? It's very easy to be engaged in Christian work, to teach Christian things, to teach Christian principles, to be about Christian activities, and yet find ourselves living by the world's standards. Do it unto others before they do it unto you. Quid pro quo. And it's at those places Jesus says, stop and step back and think about your God. Think about who he is. Think about what he has done for you. Think about the example he has left for you. Think about the high calling that it is to be the son of the Most High. Think about the command that he has given you to carry out through the grace that he so richly supplies. And that's what Jesus is saying it really comes back to. If, if you know him, if you have tasted him and you know that he is good, there's, there's only one thing you and I can do. And that is in our attitude, in our words, in our lives, to put on display what a great God he is that others would see and by his grace know and come to this God and stand with us and marvel in and reflect that mercy. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the high privilege that it is to be yours. And Father, even as we think about this hard work, of loving our enemies. Easy to say as we sit in the comfort of our homes, as we take in the words of this message, that Father, we know how hard this is to do. We pray that you would help us as we look at ourselves and our own lives <clears throat> to think about the people whom you have put in our lives, some who are easy to love, some who are not, some even who are enemies, as Jesus would describe them. We pray, Father, that you would give us grace to do good, to love, as Christ would have us to do. We pray that you would help us to think especially of all that you have done for us and are doing for us in Jesus Christ and the great cost the cost of your own son, that we would be brought near as sinners, as rebels, as beggars, and be filled full. And we pray that we would take up this work, not as some burden, but rather as a delight, a joy. But even in, in the hard places, in the sorrow and in the tears, there would be great joy as we gaze upon you as we know the privilege that it is to serve you in such times as these. And we pray in all of this, Father, that you would bring glory, not to us, but to the only one to whom it's due, to yourself, through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.